Good evening, uh, friends. I'm Homi Baba. I direct the Mahindra Humanities Center. And I'm delighted to have you here today in the company of uh, four extremely interesting panelists who will take up this issue of democracy in distress. Uh, Srinivas Jain, who is our featured speaker and visitor at the Humanity Center, is managing editor of the New Delhi Television, NDTV, India's most respected 24-hour news and current affairs broadcaster. He anchors an award-winning weekly ground reportage and investigative show called Truth vs. Hype, which focuses on political corruption, conflict zones, and untold stories of social tensions and economic inequalities. He also anchors a daily show called Reality Check, which aims at debunking official myths and government propaganda. He has been with NDTV since 1995, during which he has done stints as managing editor of Profit, NDTV's business channel, and as head of NDTV's Mumbai Bureau for eight years. Welcome, Vasu. Shugata Bose is Gardner Professor of Oceanic History and Affairs at Harvard and a member of the Indian Parliament for the Jadapur constituency. His books include Nation as Mother and Other Visions of Nationhood and His Majesty's Opponent, Subhash Chandra Bose and India's Struggle Against Empire. Welcome, Shugato. Rohit De is a lawyer and assistant professor of history at Yale. His book, A People's Constitution, The Everyday Life of Law in the Indian Republic, explores how the Indian Constitution came to permeate everyday life and imagination in India during its transition from a colonial state to a democratic republic. Aisha Jalal is Mary Richardson Professor of History and Director of the South Asian and Indian Ocean Studies at Tufts. Her books include The Struggle for Pakistan, A Muslim Homeland and Global Politics, and The Pity of Partition, Manto's Life, Times and Works Across the India-Pakistan Divide. Now, skeptical as I am of global descriptions and global prescriptions, I feel somehow that the term democracy in distress has a resonance across several countries and indeed continents. We usually spoke of democracy in distress with an utopian eye and a utopian vision. The distresses of democracy were its deficits, and we often felt that through political organization, legal reformation, we would be able to actually overcome these democratic deficits, even though that might be a very utopian way. But it was part of a certain progressive vision that we had, what Derrida once called the democracy to come. It was, it was an aspiration. Today, it seems to me that various democratic practices and institutions have somehow turned against themselves, are confronted with a strange, alienating vision of the democratic process as if they are struck with a kind of autoimmune disease, as if the beast and the body is being consumed from within. The democratic body has turned against itself. As we know, that as we um, bemoan many anti-democratic movements, these are movements that, uh, that are, have been instituted through democratic 
voting patterns and through democratic institutions, whether or not they have been subject to corruption or subject to manipulation or nepotism is an, is an issue. But it's, this, is, this notion of an autoimmunity, kind of a devouring from, the, from within, strikes me as this particular kind of distress that we're witnessing now. And of course, there have been other moments, such as the interwar period in Europe, where something very similar was happening. But of course, today, this autoimmune disease has afflicts the US, India, Turkey, Pakistan, Venezuela, Philippines, of course, in each case, in its different ways. But I want to emphasize that this is a kind of global condition. But of course, to make the global a critical hermeneutic, we can't simply rest on comparisons. We have to talk about systemic differences and structural issues. There is, we believe, a crisis in certain voting practices and patterns, a crisis in political volition, a crisis in constitutional issues, a crisis in demographic situations, and a crisis of a kind in civil society. What I'm calling the autoimmune condition, the destruction from within, reminds me, as I was jotting down these notes, of a statement by Theodore Adorno in Minima Moralia, where Adorno says that he was less threatened by the frank face, the frank visible face of fascism, than he was threatened by the fascistic elements within social democracy. And it is with this rise of this peculiar hybrid monster, which has reared its head before, of a democratic process and a despotic, tyrannical politics, that I believe we should concern ourselves today, this doubly articulated world. One of the issues that brings me to Vasu's important contribution uh, today are forms of democratic distraction, the forms of the perversions and disfiguring of what we call free speech and free expression in the media itself. It seems to me as if there is a continual speeding up, an over-talking which, which produces a kind of di a, a dialectic of deletion, that the more you hear the continual, the continual facts, the, the, the news cycle is such that it's very difficult, actually, to grasp a thread, to grasp an argument, to grasp a particular direction. You know, Gramsci once said, again very relevantly, I think, the whole question of hegemonic discourse should be understood in media terms like turning up the volume of a radio. So the hegemony creates for itself this dominating soundscape. And in many democratic countries, initially, although perhaps not at the end of the process, Voices emerge, voices become fainter and fainter and fainter. The effort for representation becomes more dangerous and more difficult. And suddenly, when we least expect it, the sounding of the state is so loud that all other voices are stilled. Vasu's contribution has been valiant in a context in India where one gets addicted, as indeed I am addicted, to late night political programs where the voices and the contending voices are so overwhelming that you hear nothing, nobody listens to each other. But it does have a kind of weird sedative-like 
effect, certainly on me. Uh, I listen to some of these channels for a while because you feel that there's going to be some ferment of discussion, which of course there isn't. And then you listen to Vasu and others like him who really try and keep the sanity in, of, of, of conversation. The sanity, not just the rationality of conversation because Vasu is as interested in political affect as he is in political rationality. But keeping this going gives you a sense of the politics you are living in every day in different ways. A kind of everyday encounter with what is both constitutional and what is not constitutional. It is in this sense then that I want to welcome you to what I'm sure will be a remarkable set of speakers and discussions. We will try to be energetic in our engagements without erasing each other. And I hope at the end of the speaker's uh, contributions, you will enter wholeheartedly into the discussion. Let us mark today as a day where we analyze the distresses of democracy without adding to them. <laughs> Thank you very much for being with us. Vasu will now speak for about 30 minutes. We will then bring up our panel, and after their contributions and interventions, we will ask you to join us in a larger conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Homi. Thanks uh, to the Mahindra Humanities Center as well for inviting me. It's the dream of every Indian, or perhaps every South Asian, to say, I am Harvard returned. So thanks for making that dream come true. I can now go back and say I've been to Harvard with, of course, the tiniest footnote for a week. But uh, in case anyone gets in touch, do keep the details fuzzy because as we know, perception matters more than reality these days. <laughs> now it's tempting when you're sharing a platform with such renowned academics to try and sound more knowledgeable than you actually are. But I'll stick to what I know best and to which Homi referred, which is to describe to you how we are trying to use the tools of everyday journalism to report on the new threats to Indian democracy and the consequences of that reportage to us as a media. Now, one of the problems we face when we talk about a crisis of democracy in South Asia is that democracy is perpetually in crisis in South Asia. So that makes it hard to capture the particular nature of the present crisis without running into what in social media is called whataboutry. You criticize the age of Modi, and you're immediately pointed to the excesses of Indira Gandhi. In India, we've already gone back to the era of Nehru. Nehru used to stifle dissent. This is a global phenomenon. I'm sure it's very much the same case here. The moment you talk about how things have worsened under Trump, you're immediately referred to how, well, there was a huge spike in drone attacks under Obama and so on. Now, this dilemma came home most sharply in India in the fall of 2015, when after the particularly brutal mob killing of a Muslim man in Uttar Pradesh, a province in North India, on allegations that he was slaughtering a cow, and after the shooting to death of a dissenting scholar, M.M. M. Kalburgi, in Karnataka, a large number of Indian writers, academics, scholars, and playwrights returned their government awards. This included the writer Nayantra Segal, the poet Ashok Vajpayee, and so on. They claimed they were protesting a growing climate of intolerance, or as one of them put it, of an assault on freedom of life and expression. 
They were immediately mocked for this by the establishment and its supporters for making vague protestations. Vigilantism, they said, is not new. And dissent has had a long history of being stifled in the Indian Republic, which are on the face of it valid assertions. Well, thanks to reporting by us and others, we now have a fairly powerful evidence, a mix of data and anecdotal reportage, that allows us to argue that some things have demonstrably worsened under this government. And also why these new threats are harder to characterize than in the past. In my view, one of the reasons is that the reference points when we speak about democracy in distress, about shocks to Indian democracy, tend to be singular catastrophic events. So when we think about an assault against democratic checks and balances, we immediately think of the emergency of 1975. Right, so I think um, uh, you know, the point I was trying to make is that the older patterns of conceiving of shocks to Indian democracy in these singular apocalyptic terms has changed. As I mentioned, when we talked about threats to the institutions of democracy, we think of the emergency. When we think about threats to India's secular fabric, the idea of India as a liberal democracy, we think of the Ayodhya movement, the Babri Masjid demolition, the Gujarat riots of 2002 more recently. Today what we have is a gradual everyday poisoning of the collective well, of a million daily regime-backed mutinies, if you will. Those in positions of authority are enabling the mainstreaming at an unprecedented level of the movements and conspiracy theories of the Hindu right. So instead of a single dramatic statement of sectarianism by a big leader like L.K. Advani during the Ram Temple movement, hate speech has been outsourced to countless subordinates who keep up a litany of near daily provocations. What are some of these fringe obsessions that are being amplified? As we know, the high-pitched noise around cow protection, for instance. Possibly as a result of that, instead of a single epic Hindu-Muslim riot like Gujarat, we have a series of smaller conflagrations where the targets end up being Muslims, but these are what the writer Mukul Keswan described as boutique executions. What else? We're seeing the rapid metastasis of the idea of love jihad, until recently a largely ignored virulent right-wing conspiracy about Muslim men wooing and converting Hindu women on false pretenses. Similarly, instead of the Brahmastra of emergency, Brahmastra being a mythological term, an equivalent of a sort of nuclear button, use the method of a thousand cuts to wear down the institutions of democracy, be it the judiciary, the investigative agencies, parliament, the courts, and of course, the one for which I work, the media. Now, all this is no longer liberal paranoia unmoored from facts. We have, as I mentioned, been doing considerable amount of reportage around this, and I think of this as counting hate, or to be a little more dramatic, counting political evil. In April this year, we set out to tabulate hateful comments made by high-ranking Indian political figures, ministers, governors, chief ministers of Indian provincial assemblies, members of parliament, members of legislative assemblies, party bosses, and so on. By hate speech, we meant comments that are directly bigoted or use dog whistles, target minorities, and call for violence. These were sourced from the public domain by scrolling through thousands of entries. This phenomenon, and let's uh, now put up the first slide, we call it VIP hate speech, which is not new in Indian politics, but has risen dramatically under the Modi government. 520% increase in the past four and a half years compared to the previous years under the Congress. From May 2014 to the present, there have been 131 instances of VIP hate speech compared to 21 instances under the Congress. If you could just uh, change the slide. Now, 90% of the hateful comments made during this particular government, under the government's watch, are by the BJP and its politicians. In only six cases, 5% of all instances, is there evidence of a politician being reprimanded or cautioned or issuing a public apology. 
95% of the time, the VIP hater faced no consequence. Far from it, we found VIP haters get promoted and that a significant number of them are multiple offenders. Not surprisingly, a significant number of those hateful comments are about threats to the Indian cow. Let me play you a little clip. The entire program that we aired was an hour long. I'll just play you a short clip from it of some of the key excerpts that will give you a sense of the sort of comments that are being made. All right, then further proof that hate has no consequences. In 21 cases, the VIP hater has been a repeat offender. Here are the most notorious repeat offenders, starting with a BJP MLA from Telangana. मुसलमान तो देश के अंदर रहना नहीं चाहिए उन्होंने जनसंख्या के आधार पर देश का बंटवारा कर लिया तो फिर यहाँ इस देश के अंदर रहने की क्या आवश्यकता थी फिर उनको अलग भूभाग दे दिया गया बांग्लादेश या पाकिस्तान जाए यहाँ क्या काम है उनका Now, a significant number of instances of hate speech also invoke the rhetoric of cow protection, something that has gained currency under this government. Elected leaders, including MPs, MLAs and even chief ministers, have used the language of vigilantes while calling for violence against those who kill cows. हमारी माँ का कोई अपमान करेगा हम मर जाएंगे सहन नहीं करेंगे मर जाएंगे मार देंगे हमारी भारत माता रोज क्या कर रही है इंडिया भारत माता की तरफ कोई उंगली उठाता है कोई आतंकी तो हमारे लोग शहीद भी होते हैं सामने वाले को मारते भी हमारे छात्रों को रूस अमेरिका जर्मनी और इंग्लैंड के वैज्ञानिकों ने भी सिद्ध किया कि भारत के गोवंश का अगर असमय खून गिरेगा धरती पर Another popular theme of VIP haters was repeated attempts to delegitimize the Muslim faith, urging Muslims to accept their Hindu ancestry and inciting fears of a Muslim takeover by playing on fears of their excessive fertility. उसके लिए हिंदू जुम्मेदार नहीं है जुम्मेदार वो है जो चार बीबी और चालीस बच्चों की बात करते हैं So Subramanian Swami also tweeting on this again and again about how Muslims should accept that they're Hindu too many tweets for us to list all of them but here's just a sampling And also Surendra Singh, BJP MLA about Muslims having to assimilate into the country those who are free no, no, don't do it are free to leave Another BJP MP, don't try to tell us we won't tolerate insults to the community. Let's decide a date, take on the Muslims, and what have you? Okay, um, so you can uh, imagine that was just a sampling. This is a volcano of hate speech, provocative speech by leading politicians and establishment figures. These are not fringe elements. As I said, we only selected those who hold high office, and if one was trying to characterize what has changed, again coming back to the dilemma of these award-returning intellectuals who are trying to give voice to their anxiety, that intolerance was on the rise. This is what actually has spiked dramatically. This kind of high-level uh, bigotry and this kind of high-level legitimizing of hate. Now, we conducted a similar exercise in counting vigilante attacks in the name of the cow. And uh, if I can just play you the next clip, these are uh, just a sampling uh, of, uh, you know, the videos that are made of these attacks. And uh, these are videos that are often made on cell phones. If we can just play that 
for a second. It's uh, it's actually. A so, for those uh, who may not be familiar with this phenomenon, these are mostly Muslims who are often beaten to death, mostly by Hindu mobs on the pretext that they are slaughtering cows or transporting cows for slaughter. These are incidents that are happening all over India, and. Uh, the meetings often take place in a very leisurely way. There seems to be no great pressure of any kind of intervention uh, from the police. Posing as a research scholar from you. Uh, if we can just go back to the, uh, the slides. So, right. Now, uh, when we counted, we found that these sorts of attacks, vigilante attacks, have also dramatically risen. They've gone up by almost 9,000% under the life of this government compared to the previous Congress government. 35 have been killed in the past 4.5 years, none that we could find under UPA2. 90% of those that are killed are Muslim. So that's an average of one Muslim that's been killed every two months under the watch of the present government. Just to point out that this is open source data collection done by us and by uh, India Spend, which is a fact-checking website. But this is by no means comprehensive, as with the hate tracker. And we've left it open for people to come in and make suggestions. But so far, these figures have not been challenged. Is there another slide? Right, sorry. This is just uh, more on similar lines. Now, um, moving on to the government's response. The response tends to be, this is terrible, but the regime has nothing to do with it. We, the government, condemn violence and order that all offenders be brought to book. But we just heard from the establishment itself how they, in a sense, legitimize this kind of violence. I'll give you more examples. I'm going to now play for you a clip. This was a hidden camera investigation we did into a lynching that happened this year in Uttar Pradesh. The accused in so many cases walk out on bail because the courts say the police failed to provide convincing evidence. We sent a team armed with a hidden camera to talk to some of the accused, posing as sympathizers. Just listen to how confidently they both admit to the crime and also to the tacit or open support they're receiving from the police. <coughs> Doing field research on RSS and Hindutva outfit, we asked Rakesh that whether he was pleased with what he had done. Rakesh not only admitted that he did play a role in the lynching, but also that it was very much related to cow slaughter. He said even while in jail for five weeks, he proudly declared what he had done before jail authorities. He says he was released from bail to a hero's welcome, which has only added to the numbers of what he calls his mini army. The only mistake he claims is that his boys made cell phone videos.
He also said that the police was in their favor, unlike in the earlier regime. The police are talking about the government. The government is not the government. And this was all the government. The other police are not the government. If we were sitting there, then we would have to become a government. And this is the 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 government. पचास लाख मिला होता फ्लैट भी मिला होता पक्का वाला हमारे भाई मर गए वहाँ जेल में पीछे भी मैंने उस पर आंदोलन किया एक रवि लड़का वहीं मर गया था कई दिन उसकी बॉडी रखी भी सारा गांव में और जब पच्चीस लाख डी उन्हें दिया था दिया नहीं था मैंने कहा तेरी बॉडी को आपके तो मदद कर ले जाते आपकी मदद हो गई in the video, Kasim badly wounded. A bystander is heard asking for him to be given water. This is Rakesh's chilling response. Kasim was saying, brother, so uh, there is, uh, I know that was, uh, uh, you know, that's very distressing video, but there has been some sort of positive outcome of this, uh, at least on uh, paper. The police have said that they've taken this thing that we've done, we did it into a few other cases as well, as evidence. Uh, there is a provision under the Indian law in which they can admit this as extrajudicial confession, and they've moved the court to try and see if they can rearrest these men. But we'll have to wait and see uh, if that happens. The Supreme Court has also opened an inquiry into the absence of an effective prosecution of this and some of the other vigilante cases by the police. The third element, uh, which I mentioned uh, before I wrap up, was, of course, love jihad. Now, this is not something which it is easy to compile data on, but there is a mass of anecdotal evidence of how the BJP leadership, local as well as national, in many cases have created a noise, in some cases almost enabling a near riot situation over bogus claims of love jihad. I'm going to play you next a clip from a particular egregious example from Meerut in Uttar Pradesh in 2014, where right-wing groups led by local uh, BJP politicians, claimed that a young Hindu woman had been seduced by a Muslim, gang raped in a madrasa, which is a Muslim uh, seminary, including by a Maulana or a cleric, impregnated, converted to Islam, and then her baby was aborted. This was the claim. Based on uh, the young woman's testimony, the police arrested a number of local Muslims and there was a near riot in that area. When we went down there, we found multiple anomalies in the version that the right wing had claimed, as well as which the girl had been coerced to repeat. It was a case, as many of these cases are, of simply criminalizing and politicizing an interfaith relationship. Now, the entire uh, video, the entire sort of unraveling of, of the story was over a much longer documentary, but in the interest of time, we're just going to play you a short clip. In the village of Aurangabad, an hour from Meerut, a VHP village meeting to warn of a love jihad epidemic. Not too many in the audience have heard of it. Which is why the constant repetition of the merit episode. The stakes so high that the young woman at the heart of the storm has been pushed into making her own defense public. But the police say right from the start there have been inconsistencies. In the FIR registered on the 3rd of August, 
She says the abduction took place on the 23rd of July and the rape occurred on the same day in a madrasa in Hapur by Nawab and four unnamed men. But in her medical examination on the same day, she told the doctor the rape occurred on the 29th of June in an open field. Two days later, in a more detailed statement before the magistrate, she goes back to saying that the rape occurred in the Hapur Madrasa, but the rapists were two men, Nawab and a boy called Shanu. Sana Ullah, she says, molested but did not rape her. मेरे बहन एक सौ चौसठ के भी हुई है और सारे जो मैंने अब तक देते हैं ये सब हुई हैं डेट भी हुई हैं कोई डेट गलत लिख रहा हो तो मैं क्या करूँ कंफ्यूज होगा कोई उन्तीस जून को उन्तीस जुलाई लिख रहा सत्ताईस जुलाई मैं इसमें क्या कर सकती हूँ आपने आप कह रही हैं आपने अपना बयान सारी हैं � जो कलीम नाम का उद्धन है इसका नाम शुरू से लेकर क्यों नहीं चली सरावे वालों का डॉक्टर नवाब का या सनाउल्ला का या सानू का इस तरीके से सरावे वालों के नाम क्यों आए वो कलीम का नाम छुपा के क्यों चली जो का क्या है इसमें कलीम उद्धन का जो ऑपरेशन हुआ पांच दिन उस तेईस जुलाई से लेकर सत्ताईस तक एडमिट रही अस्पताल में और वहाँ उसने ऑपरेशन करा उस कलीम नाम जो उसका पति बना इन द मेरठ गवर्नमेंट हॉस्पिटल वे हर सर्जरी वॉज परफॉर्म द पेपर आर साइंड बाई अ कलीम posing as a husband, a signature which has led to his arrest. Actually, there was no female attendant with her and there were two guys with uh, her. Uh, out of them, one was uh, presenting as her husband and I don't know whether he was her husband or not. And she came as an emergency case, uh, as a case of ruptured ectopic pregnancy. And at that time, uh, it was not a highlighted case. She came to us as a simple patient. Right. And for that, an emergency laparotomy has to be done to save her life. The problem over But in her statement, she names Shanu, not Kaleem. Operation कौन ले गया आपको? कौन कौन थे वहाँ? ये Shanu थे. अच्छा. और ये सब मिले हुए थे, लेकिन Shanu साथ था. Shanu साथ था. जी. अच्छा, उन्होंने करवाया operation. हाँ जी. पति के रूप में. कोई Kaleem भी था क्या, जिसने मतलब जो दस्तखत किए हैं वहाँ? जी, मैं Kaleem को नहीं जानती. अच्छा, Kaleem को नहीं जानती हूँ. जी. अच्छा. नहीं क्योंकि अस्पताल के कागज में कलीम ने ही दस्तखत किया है। मुझे नहीं पता वो कितने नाम क्या कर रहे हैं वो जी मैं तो शानू को जानती हूँ। Keeping two people। Seema Mishra works with a group that has helped couples who face risks for having broken family taboos. Families। To her, the Meerut incident follows a familiar pattern. What I find is, which is very common, is that adult men and women get into relationships, and when the families don't like it, then all hell breaks loose and they go off and file a whole lot of criminal uh, cases against the boy. And the police then forces them. It's a typical pattern that we who have been working in uh, Uttar Pradesh for the last 10 years have seen this happening. And there's so much pressure on the girl to take, uh, take the girl back. Let me say this. This is not about discrediting the testimony of a rape survivor. We know how difficult it is for women to speak up about sexual violence. But here's the problem with the Meerut case that the Sangh Parivar has already pronounced its verdict without factoring in any of these inconsistencies, even while the investigation is at a nascent stage. Now this places the individuals at the heart of it at great risk, but also has incendiary social repercussions, and hence the need to look closely at the Meerut episode. Right, uh, let's just uh, pull up that last uh, image. So this uh, was an instance where actually there was a happy ending. This is the young woman that we just interviewed. So she finally came out in the open along with her partner Kaleem, the person whose identity she was hiding throughout and who she had actually named as an accomplice. So they couldn't control their, you know, they couldn't contain the emotions anymore. And they, you know, broke against the family taboo. They broke against the kind of pressure that was being placed by, uh, you know, the political forces that had got involved. And they got married. And for a while, they lived in police custody, not police custody, but under police protection. But finally now they were able to come out of that and, uh, you know, they are united. But it just gives you one more example of how just ordinary interfaith relationships get criminalized and politicized. And that really is the story of how this love jihad, uh, you know, myth has been built up. So in conclusion, I'll say there are uh, more video, but uh, we're running short of time. So I'll, I'll wrap up and then we can, you know, take uh, more of, of these aspects into the discussion. That it could be argued that the slow poisoning of the well or the air 
is as if not more toxic than the egregious shocks and the egregious crimes on Indian democracy by past political regimes. Thank you very much. And, and thank you so much, Julia, for <laughs> gamely playing all those clips. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you so much. Basu, please, I show you. Should I must take you here? I show here. No, here. Hi. Been a long time in my Basu, thank you so much. That is really quite, I mean, for those of us who've been in India frequently, it both rings true, but it also rings horrific. Um, let me start with Aisha. Aisha, your comments and reflections. I've asked everybody to speak for between eight and ten minutes, and then we'll open up. So please. I mean, it, what's not clear is whether we're supposed to respond to him. You are supposed to respond, and you're supposed to say whatever you have in mind. So you can well, do both things. Yes, OK. Um, well, thank you very much, uh, Humi, for inviting me um, uh, to the Humanities Center at Harvard. Um, I mean, the subject is obviously uh, has, I mean, one can approach it at many levels. Uh, but I do want to say that uh, democracy, as um, you pointed out, I mean, has been in distress in South Asia, uh, certainly in Pakistan. Um, and many years ago, I wrote a book uh, talking about the stresses and strains of post-colonial nation states with particular reference to South Asia and uh, made the point that uh, neither was democracy the antithetical um, uh, entity, I mean, opposite to authoritarianism, but they were imbricated and it was about dominance and resistance and it's an ongoing struggle. And my own only comment uh, to uh, the presentation here uh, is that while I'm, I mean, nothing, none of this surprised me. Um, I, of course, uh, recognize that this is happening uh, quite broadly in South Asia. Um, and I do think that the media uh, is being targeted, but the media is also part of the problem uh, in terms of the way in which uh, this is being reporting. I'm not really talking about your media, your house, uh, but certainly I think um, that uh, what I'm referring to is not simply democracy and numbers here. I'm talking about narratives. Uh, I'm talking about national narratives, un, um, I mean un, uh, unquestioned ones, uh, certainly in India, uh, about the Muslim about partition, about Pakistan, all these factors play a role uh, which give these elements that you speak about so eloquently uh, the opportunity uh, to carry out whatever they are carrying out. So the complicity of those who are the great upholders of democracy must be called into question here as well. Because without that complicity, none of this is possible. Uh, so whilst you talk about the role of the state quite eloquently, and clearly this is only possible in India because the state tolerates it, uh, but I can sort of say many things about Pakistan from which I think India could learn uh, because Pakistan has a head start uh, in how to control um, uh, democracy, muzzle it completely. Uh, so let me just say a few things uh, about Pakistan so that might sort of in be indicative of what way you're going. Um, we recently had an election. I happen to be watching it. There were many theories about this election, uh, what was going on. Uh, the most interesting thing was, of course, the pre-electoral uh, the, the, the run-up to the election and the narratives that were dominant at that stage, the unquestioned narratives that you were referring to as well in the case of India. Um, and it was clear that these were quite orchestrated. These were not just happening, they were orchestrated narratives. Uh, so there were various theories about what was going on. Everybody was talking about election being manipulated. And I won't bore you with the details from the census to the constituency um, uh, delimitation, but I will talk about um, the narratives that preceded the election. Of course, there had been a soft coup the year before uh, that some of you probably never noticed in July when a prime minister was simply removed by the judiciary. Uh, but in the case of the run-up to the election, it was not just manipulated, but there was an extraordinary buy-in of one channel after the other. Every channel was behind it, barring one or two. Um, and they, they fell in line too after the election. So what I'm trying to say is that in this great democratic tradition, what you're witnessing is a great consensus building by the media, which then generates the kind of atmosphere for these sorts of 
outrageous, egregious uh, behavior. Um, I, can, I, can, I can recount all of that, but it also lends legitimacy to certain actions that are, by, by giving it the narrative of religiosity. Now, what you described to me for the last half hour is nothing but politics. But, uh, but what you have thrown in are Hindus and Muslims, and it gets some religiosity involved here. But this is politics. This is electoral manipulation, electoral mobilization. The same thing happens in Pakistan. Um, but uh, in Pakistan's case, the theory about what happened in the election was it's always happened. The who, what's new? The mili so what's new? The military has all the military uh, uh, establishment always intervenes. Uh, so this is the same. Uh, the second theory was that no, uh, this is a time when there is a pushback from society, so they're working extra hard to manipulate. This is a sign that, you know, why are they going so hard against social media? Uh, this is because people are going to be, uh, it's, it's effective, and people are beginning to challenge the authoritarian uh, strains of the Pakistani state. The third, which I think actually explains the first two and brings them together, is the role of the media. Uh, now, the Pakistani uh, establishment, uh, for, by which we refer to the, uh, the non-elected institutions, the military, the bureaucracy, the judiciary, um, the establishment has, uh, uh, you know, for, for a long time, uh, uh, you know, played a role um, uh, in, in, in elections, of course. But this time around, I think um, the, the, the role was more direct. Uh, in this instance, it was the judiciary working hand in glove with the military uh, to, to, to get the positive result that they wanted, with the media playing a role. And so this time, what was surprising for me in Pakistan was the attack on the media, the main media houses, uh, Geo, followed by Dawn. Clearly, the military now wants to dominate the narrative. But as is always the case with attempts at domination and control, uh, there's always a slippage. Historically, we have seen, and I think um, I, I saw uh, my friend um, uh, Kafadar sitting here, Turkey in Evren's time, what they tried to do, I mean, it, it sort of you know, it, it, it sort of backfired on them. You can only do so much controlling of, to get positive results. Because in the case of the Evren period, I mean, the, 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 the used utilization of right wing against left wing, but then comes to haunt them in the form of the, a variety of right wing parties that they have to control. I think this is where I feel uh, that this, the, the correction sets in for such attempts. Um, so I think that the Pakistani, uh, uh, the real jo joker in the pack in Pakistan is going to prove to be governance, uh, which I think cannot be controlled. You can put anybody in place, but the real beauty of the whole um, a, a system will, I mean, in terms of the results, will lie of who can deliver. And there's a big question mark whether anybody can deliver, which I think is the real issue of uh, distracting people with cow slaughter, with this, that, or the other, that, what you were also referring to, the distractive politics, the disassociative politics. I think this is what is the distress of democracy. But my last, uh, 10 minutes? Yeah. Mm -hmm. My last po comment is that in Pakistan, at least, it's been foisted upon the people of Pakistan by the non-elected institutions, notably uh, the military. There have been military interventions. But I think the worry for India is that Indians themselves are doing this to themselves. They are electing such governments. So I think therein lies the challenge for India, uh, whether uh, you do, in fact, have people uh, with the right mind and boldness to speak up and fight back. Uh, in Pakistan, Pakistanis are fighting military rule as best as they can, um, and even governments that the military puts up. Uh, but that story is continuing. But what is worrying are, is the gap that seems to be increasing between how much people are becoming complicitous without realizing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aisha. I think this whole issue of complicity creates a kind of fine echo and resonance between the two accounts. Aisha did bring in the issue of the military. Of course, that's a different kind of state, and I think that's a very important distinction to make. But also the relationship between the media and judiciary. I just want to mark that, the idea of judiciary and the media was a new issue. I talked about distraction in the earlier uh, in my introductory remarks, where I did not talk about the judiciary, nor did you. And rather than the military, we seem to see the arm of the police being used. So I think police versus military, question of judiciary, these are questions that Aisha has put on the table. Thank you very much. Shugato. Thank you very much. Um, since uh, uh, Vasu focused on this awful spectacle of, uh, of lynchings, 
you know, let me uh, let me begin uh, by reading a, a short passage from a book that was published uh, over a hundred years ago by Rabindranath Tagore. And towards the end of that uh, book, uh, in uh, an essay titled "Nationalism in India," uh, Tagore said a few things both about the United States uh, and uh, India. Uh, that sound like an uncanny foretelling uh, of the cr crises that both our countries face today. So Tagore criticized the anti-Asiatic agitations in America for depriving the aliens of their right to earn their honest living on these shores. Either you shut your doors against the aliens or reduce them into slavery, Tagore said in his rebuke. And he had something even more perceptive and far-sighted to say about the tyranny of social restrictions in India. The social habit of mind, he wrote, which impels us to make the life of our fellow beings a burden to them, where they differ from us, even in such a thing as their choice of food, is sure to persist in our political organization and result in creating engines of coercion to crush every rational difference which is the sign of life. And tyranny, will only add to the inevitable lies and hypocrisy in our political life. Now, I uh, entered uh, Parliament uh, on uh, an unhappy day, uh, the 16th of May 2014. Uh, that was the day that uh, the Narendra Modi-led uh, BJP won a clear majority in India's uh, Parliament. And, um, you know, one of the um, features of Modi's campaign was uh, the tendency to use the language of citizenship to mask a discrimination along lines of religion, language, and ethnicity. So during the campaign, uh, he had said that on the 16th of May 2014, he would drive all illegal immigrants across the border of Bangladesh. Modi had spoken about illegal immigrants two years before Trump did more or less the same thing during his campaign in 2016. I gave my first speech in Parliament on the same day as Narendra Modi and that was noted by the media, including Vasu's NDTV. And towards the end of that speech, I made reference to perhaps what could be regarded as the first lynching of the Modi era. This one was not directly re related to cow vigilantism, but this is what happened. As I said, we mourn the death of Mohsin Sheikh, the young computer engineer in Pune. He belonged to the so-called aspirational class whose dreams for the future had been fired by the election campaign of the ruling party. He did not live to see the Ache Din, the good times which this government promises to usher in. His only fault was that he wore his identity in his headgear and attire as he returned home after praying to the Almighty. Hockey sticks that had once done our nation proud in the world of sports were used as weapons to bludgeon the expression of diversity. Now, after that, of course, there were several other uh, incidents of uh, lynching. And uh, what I would say is that um, the one that, uh, uh, that uh, was not specifically mentioned by Vasu was that uh, of uh, the killing of Muhammad Akhlaq on the suspicion that he had stored beef in his refrigerator. And it was in the aftermath of that kind of killing and the return of awards by writers and scholars and so on that there was a debate in parliament on quote unquote growing intolerance in India. And the term intolerance is of course just a euphemism for a wave of unreason and humanity that was uh, sweeping the country. On that occasion, I decided to consult uh, my young friend Rohit Dey uh, and spoke mostly about constitutional morality, 
the way in which Ambedkar had spoken about it and other members of the, of the Constituent Assembly. But even in that speech towards the end, I again had to mourn a death. And I said I had mourned the death of Mohsin Sheikh, the computer engineer in Pune. This happened days after the new government took power. Today I mourn the death, death of Muhammad Aklaq and others who have been victims in recent months of the poison of religious hatred. In the name of bygone generations that have welded the Indian people into a nation, I invoke the noble meaning of the word Aklaq. What does Aklaq mean? It means ethics. And I urge those who hold the reins of power in our country today, especially our Prime Minister and our Home Minister, to uphold the fundamental right to life and liberty of all our citizens and abide by Aklaq, the ethics of good governance that have informed the very best of Indian political thought and practice through the ages. Now, in addition to the kind of hate speech uh, that you heard played, by people holding important offices, there is something else that also needs to be underlined. And that is the feeblest of disavowals of dis or disapprovals coming from those occupying the topmost echelons of government when these kinds of horrendous lynchings have uh, taken place. And, uh, you know, Modi has been typically very late, and then he has not been unambiguous in the condemnation. And so this is in some ways a, a, a part of a strategy. Uh, it, it is in some ways more insidious than bigger riots or even pogroms of the sort that we saw in Gujarat in 2002. You simply have to make a spectacle of killing one person or two and doing so, you can then terrify an entire community. And this is what, is what is being done to the Muslims and Dalits in our country today. So it is very much a part of the strategy uh, that has been adopted by those uh, who basically confuse religious majoritarianism with democracy and deliberately so. So I think I'll stop my initial comments here, excepting that I did want to say a few words about what uh, has happened uh, in terms of another, uh, other, another kind of institution that has been under grave threat. And I can speak about it in you know, question and answer. And this is what has been done to the institutions of higher education in our country. And once again, there was a major debate in February of 2016 on current, the current situation in universities in our country. This happened uh, soon after the suicide of Rohit Vemula of Hyderabad Central University. And you know what has happened in our country is that uh, people uh, from marginalized backgrounds have been given access to our universities, including our central universities, but they have not really been included as equal citizens. Uh, so there was uh, neglect before, but now there is direct onslaught by the state forces. And soon after the Hyderabad uh, uh, incident, and I spoke about Rohit Febula's suicide in the course of my speech, uh, 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 there was uh, the crisis in Jawaharlal Nehru University, and students, including the president of the Jawaharlal Nehru Students uh, Union, uh, was arrested and charged with sedition. Uh, and after uh, the arrested students were brought to the court premises of Patiala House in New Delhi, the stormtroopers, the black-coated stormtroopers of the ruling party attacked teachers and students and journalists within the premises of the judiciary. And there's been a systematic attack uh, on higher educational uh, institutions. And uh, there is almost a deliberate policy to, demoral to demoralize our best public institutions of higher learning uh, through the drafting of a new higher education commission bill, which is of course being resisted. 
And also, uh, there has not been a single uh, major central or state university that has been included on the list of institutions of eminence um, chosen by a committee uh, appointed by Prime Minister uh, uh, Narendra Modi, even though a non-existent uh, university to be established by India's leading industrialist uh, has been given that particular label. So, of course, the media has been under attack. Uh, there have been other institutions that have been uh, under siege. But we, uh, sitting at a university, must also consider uh, what is uh, happening in the domain of higher education in India in this uh, you know, atmosphere of democratic authoritarianism using a strategy of religious uh, majoritarianism to win uh, uh, majorities in India's parliament? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Shugato. The question of complicity that both of you brought up is certainly a thread that is moving through the various, uh, the, through the various comments. Uh, in addition to the media and governance and the law, which uh, we, we've had, I think the issue of higher education now emerges as another topic, another item for our discussion. But with it, I think also the concern, not only for higher education, but for education more generally, the rewriting and the tampering of school books, which we know about, uh, and, 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 in, and also the uh, infestation of these ideas of exclusion at the level of uh, school education. I think this is something we should look at. But turning to you, Rohit, in the context of these conversations, of course, uh, very keen to see what you have to say. But one issue that was just brought up, which I think is something that we, I would love to hear you speaking about, is the use of the language of citizenship, a certain kind of constitutional discourse, to actually justify the complicitous uh, notions of discrimination and beyond discrimination also, degradation. And they're not the same thing. They can come together. Very often, discrimination is thought of within a kind of legal imaginary, that with the right politics and with the right uh, agitation and if we move to the law, you know, the law can get rid of discrimination and we people can be given the rights of citizenship. But now, the language of denigration, the language, the embodied language of denigration, impurity, criminality, uh, rape, um, uh, both in the United States as well as in India, the language of, of, of denigration, the de-dignified language of denigration is now taking on a power beyond any appeal to the citizen and the non-citizen. And this is why I think the migrant or the refugee becomes such a problematic flashpoint in this discourse. As the president of the ruling party recently said, we have a billion termites in our country who are sort of hollowing it uh, through. Uh, so I will address uh, the question of constitutionalism. I just wanted to uh, respond briefly to Srinivasan's uh, uh, presentation. Uh, there's a moment uh, when they're interviewing the accused uh, of um, the one who's sort of admitting to the killing, uh, he talks that there was a mistake that we recorded this on our, our phone camera. The young boys, they didn't know any better. They were enthusiastic. They were minors. It was their first time. They won't do it again. And the sort of constant image that was circulating here was very difficult to watch. But if you are on social media or open the television, these images, almost stylized images of lynchings are circulating very widely. And I'd sort of actually pause to question um, what our complicity is in sort of playing it and watching it. Um, it is important to remember that these incidents happened and it's important to remember the names of people who were killed. But these images are, are being watched by some of us with shock and horror, but they're being produced as an act of victory, an act of celebration, and they're being circulated by, as an act of celebration. And if you look at the YouTube comments, perhaps that's a sort of terrible place to go to at any point of time. The YouTube comments in many of these news stories which are pointing this out as this is a terrible thing, the YouTube comments show people who are watching it are consuming it as a celebratory spectacle. So we are actually transforming what was, it's sort of if we take the lynching postcard of the US South and we sort of put it and circulate it on national media to say it's a bad thing, but everyone sort of watches it and reacts with it with a certain kind of uh, visceral pleasure. Um, so I, I'm going to talk a little bit about the kind of tortured history of constitutionalism in South Asia, and particularly today. Uh, some people would argue that South Asia is not a good site to study constitutionalism. Indeed, um, while India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka 
all enact constitutions with certain degree of popular representation in uh, 915 in India and 71 in Pakistan, Bangladesh, 77 in Sri Lanka. These are not liberal documents by any measure. They are uh, documents that have heavily circumscribed rights and in certain cases reinforce a kind of ethno-majoritarian view of politics. However, as I want to argue very briefly, over the years they have come to act as a constraint in a variety of ways, all of which has been unraveled very sharply, not just in India, but in the neighboring South Asian countries over the last five years. So if you think of constitutions as the text uh, for the governments of uh, the one-party state in India and Sri Lanka and the uh, military regimes in Pakistan and Bangladesh, the constitution was just sort of a roadmap of power, something that was convenient, something that was malleable. So if the constitution worked against you, you would just change the constitution itself or amend the particular provision that is problematic. It wasn't conceived of as a restraint to authority, but it became one. First, through the work of lawyers and judges who created a series of conventions from the 1950s onwards, which restrained uh, government power. So just to give you a couple of examples, um, uh, in the Indian case, um, we see a broadening of judicial power over judicial appointments. So we edged out the executive's role in appointing judges and tried to at least create to some extent a, a non-political party affiliated judiciary. Uh, we also saw the rise of regulatory authorities, independent bodies under the constitution, be it the election commission or the office of the comptroller and auditor general, which exercised powers in checking the government. Um, we saw the emergence of uh, 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 challenges to the powers of constitutional amendment, as well as increasing challenges to military coups. So even when military coups were eventually justified, there were safeguards put in place and circumscribed powers through which they would operate. We saw attempts at crude force to remove the chief justice in Sri Lanka, to remove the chief justice uh, in, in Pakistan, were met with a popular uprising of professionals, particularly lawyers, who took to the streets and argued the language of the law to restore judicial authority. That has mixed results, and we can get to that in the Q&A. Uh, the second kind of movement of constitutionalism is constitutionalism as imagined by the people, people who are often excluded by the constitution, who don't have sort of guaranteed rights in the document, but strive to make it so. Uh, we see this most dramatically in India with the use of, uh, with a number of social movements in the 1990s, arguing for the right to education, the right to information, the right to food, which through a series of first judicial activism and then legislative interventions get translated into reality. And in some ways, uh, the first decade of the 21st century sees for the first time a creation of a skeletal welfare state in India as a result of social movement engagement with constitutionalism. Uh, there is an entire language of anti-corruption that leads to a rise of a new political party and the demand for an independent ombudsman, but also a rise for, uh, and, and this again has interesting legacies, a kind of media allied rise of popular justice. Um, perhaps the earliest example of this was uh, the Jessica Lal case in which Srinivasan's channel played an important role, which convinced the judiciary to sort of step in to what was obviously a corrupt criminal justice process and enact a kind of corrective trial. But it required citizens to turn to the media and turn the media into a kind of a supra-legal courtroom that would sort of decide uh, on these questions. Um, as I mentioned earlier, constitutionalism has not had an easy run in, in South Asia and comes through most dramatically in the emergencies that are taking place in India and in its neighboring countries. However, in the emergency, there was a requirement of the government to act through law. So the parliament or the president would declare emergency and the forms of the emergency would be observed. There would be a law that would then strip people of their rights, but it would have to be done through a legal process. And this sounds... Uh, almost as if I'm sort of turning uh, what is a sham exercise into virtue. But when you sort of, uh, uh, it's only in moments of like these that you realize the importance of hypocrisy in some ways, because you need to have standards to hold people up to. If people don't subscribe to standards in the first place, it becomes very difficult to sort of make claims. What's happening today in India in particular is a kind of, um, uh, as, as Srinivasan mentioned, death by a thousand cuts. Uh, there are no effective attempts to sort of change legislation, but what happens is a kind of circumvention of long established procedures. And I'm just going to run through the rest of my time a kind of listing of the nature of these, of these changes. Um, first, if we imagine constitutionalism to be a question of balance, uh, the Indian constitution struck a balance between different institutions, uh, the Judiciary Election Commission, the Army and Independent Bureaucracy and media, all of which is getting circumvented today either because of uh, 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 entirely ignoring uh, many of the institutions. Uh, people have not been appointed to several positions. For example, uh, this parliament does not have an official leader of the opposition, which means several decisions that need to be taken which require opposition's attendance cannot be taken or can be done by circumventing opposition parties. They have not appointed uh, people to be in charge until recently uh, to be the information commissioner who would bring the prime minister's office under the Right to Information Act. 
Uh, key appointments in investigative bodies have been delayed. Positions have just been left vacant. So it's almost as if you're letting institutions die by just decay, by not filling them up. Uh, secondly, and very troublingly, um, of members of these independent authorities, be it the bureaucracy, the army, or the judiciary, have been given post-retirement positions that are very closely allied to the government, to the government, be it ministers in the cabinet or posts of governors. Um, secondly, the other big balancing act the Indian Constitution does, through its kind of provision of affirmative action and the kind of vagaries of the first past the post system, is to create a representative, representative parliament that represents a, a wide diversity of constituencies. Uh, the success of India's democracy, according to uh, Christopher Jaffrelo and other political scientists, has really been the empowerment of um, groups that were formerly seen as backward, who achieved the political dominance in legislatures in the 1970s. However, today's parliament has the highest representation of upper castes, one of the highest since independence. It has the lowest representation of Muslims in independence. And if we actually take out the members of parliament from West Bengal, there would be very few Muslim MPs in parliament to begin with. We have fewer Muslim, uh, I think we, we have, I suspect we have fewer Muslim MPs than Britain does, despite the differences in population. The third kind of balance the constitution strikes is between the center and the regions. Uh, this was, of course, uh, through the early decades of independence, uh, one that was heavily skewed towards the center. Until the 1980s, we often saw the central government intervening very strongly in provincial autonomy. However, over the last 20 years, uh, there was a sense that, especially with the growth of regional parties, uh, states were protected, states' rights were protected, and indeed, the BJP in the early 2000s spoke in the language of cooperative federalism. However, we see a greater centralization of power. And most troublingly, in sort of territories uh, that are ruled by opposition governments, we see interventionist governors, most strikingly in the Union territories of Delhi and Pondicherry. Uh, we see uh, difference, differences in funding uh, between opposition and government ruled states. And in some cases, uh, castigation of entire populations of people who have not voted for the ruling party, which, which sort of troubles the links that tie India together. A uh, third is, of course, citizenship, which is the very basis of our participation in constitutional democracy. There are two developments that are, are urgent and important to note. The first is the long simmering problem of the National Citizenship Register in Assam. Um, around the 1970s, there was a compromise uh, given the kind of movement of people across the borders in South Asia to have a register of citizens which would sort of count uh, and fix citizenship uh, of people who reside in Assam. Uh, political compromise had left this process open for many years, but recently it was spurred on by a PIL to be completed, and uh, a, a couple of months ago they came out with a register, a list of citizens, which left out large chunks of the population. While the government has d agreed that there will be procedures to challenge and correct the list, the idea is very clear. There will now be an official list that will count citizens, and there are demands to replicate this list in other states. Uh, the people who will who tend to get excluded here are Bengali-speaking populations who live in Northeast India, who all always suspected of being Bangladeshi or being foreigners. And it strikes at the very core of Indian citizenship principles, which is basically not determined by blood or by religion, but basically determined by your uh, birth in a particular territory. Uh, the second troubling uh, situation here is the passing of the Citizenship Amendment Bill. Uh, Indian citizenship, and this was greatly debated in the 1940s, was uh, fixed to your parents being born in the territory that became India before a certain date. It wasn't tied to your religion or tied to your ethnicity or tied to blood. However, the Citizenship Amendment Bill allows for citizenship to be granted to Hindus, Sikhs, and Buddhists from Pakistan and Bangladesh who apply for citizenship to India. At one level, this sounds very benign. You're helping persecuted minorities get permanent status. However, the persecuted minority category does not, uh, does not extend to other groups who could face persecution, uh, be it Shias, Ahmadis, uh, uh, women, uh, LGBT populations, but is merely it, it, but focuses on non-Muslim groups, non-Abrahamic faith groups in South Asia, and tries to turn Indian citizenship into a sort of birthright citizenship of all Hindus, Sikhs, and and, and Buddhists, and poses a profound challenge to the nature of citizenship in South Asia. Um, so just to flag a, a couple of other things, um, the the most remarkable thing that happened at the beginning of this year was a kind of unprecedented uh, television conference given by the force four of the five senior most judges of the Supreme Court, mm -hmm. who came out in the public and virtually alleged, and I have to be careful of what I say because there are powerful contempt laws in India, suggested that there was political interference in the decision making uh, in the court uh, about which judges would get to hear what cases. Uh, assignments of cases were taken away from certain judges and given to other judges. The Indian court does not sit on bank, they sit in groups of judges. The Chief Justice has discretionary powers to allot cases to different judges. Um, there were also a considerable suspicion of accusations of uh, corruption against certain figures in the judiciary uh, who were believed to be complicit in this. 
Um, there was also uh, uh, a pointing out to the fact that despite a, a long established precedent that the Supreme Court has the final say in appointing judges, the government was slow in acting on the Supreme Court's recommendations. Uh, and it is perhaps not a coincidence that many of the judges who were not being appointed uh, belong to communities that were not the majority community in South Asia. Uh, there seems to have been some backtracking on this the last few months, and some of these appointments have been made late. But the way in which the Indian judiciary works, it also means that late appointments would mean that they're unlikely to rise to certain decision-making powers uh, within the judiciary. Um, I could sort of uh, uh, go on on this, but I want to just briefly try to be optimistic uh, and suggest what are possibly a few hopeful uh, areas of operation. Uh, so the first is that I think for a lot of people, I hope it becomes clear why forms matter, why conventions matter. Um, we can always say that these are authoritarian states working through shadowy forms of legality, but these forms matter in that you can at least hold states accountable. And I think there is increasing, uh, uh, at least in statements of political parties, the use of the language of the constitution to rally around and challenge the government. Uh, particularly in the absence of a charismatic sort of opposition figure, the constitution can emerge as a kind of charismatic set of opposition. The second is the interesting sort of hi local histories the constitution is taking. Um, for example, in the forested regions of Jharkhand and Chhattisgarh, there's a movement by tribal communities which are basically using the constitution, uh, physical structures of the constitution to assert tribal sovereignty over their areas. They reproduce sections of the constitution that allow for tribal control of, of, of those particular areas. Uh, strikingly, breaking with long history uh, of, of, of compliance, uh, BJP's Dalit MPs have come out publicly in opposition to perceptions that the BJP government might dilute or do away with reservations. The Supreme Court judgment diluting the prevention of atrocities on SCST Act, a kind of civil rights legislation, uh, and the fact that the government didn't do enough to sort of pull back on it was called out. It is clear that the affirmative action provisions and the kind of uh, uh, requirements for caste justice in the constitution are taken seriously by members of the community who will fight to defend it. Um, and finally, uh, I think we, it's important for us to acknowledge that this kind of breakdown of constitutionalism might be new for most people in India, but existed in pockets across the country over all times. Um, so if you were growing up in Kashmir, northeast or certain districts in Chhattisgarh, the idea that there is that constitutional acts as a check is, is almost seen as a myth. And it almost seems that our inability to respond to what happened in these regions is coming to haunt us today because we are all experiencing what this period of, of, of sort of tolerated emergency is. Um, uh, Rohit, I must I uh, will stop at this call point. you yeah. to order yeah. Yeah. <laughs> in the best parliamentary tradition. Um, very interesting, the notion of ethno-majoritarian ethno um, uh, ethno-majoritarianism is something that you have raised in these reflections on questions of constitution and citizenship and of course one of the issues that it relates to is under the ethnos what is the place of the language of religion or the language of faith how is it being manipulated but also effectively powerful it's not all manipulation people identify with it through the ethnos they identify through religious ideas I think the idea of the media as a supra-legal uh, body, as a supra-legal agency, is actually quite interesting. Where there is democracy in distress and breakdown, then it's your kind of investigative reporting that plays a, a role of governance, almost, or a proto-governance uh, issue. Uh, I would also think that the question of education that was brought up raises the issue of how the Constitution gets mediated or translated in a more ubiquitous form, given that you're interested in form like I am too, not simply in the content, but of the form of these things and the institutional form. How would the constitu these constitutional, progressive constitutional ideas that hold the country to account, how do they get mediated and translated? into, as I say, the ubiquitous or the everyday understanding of one's status or one's position or one's mutuality. These are important questions. I now want to actually uh, turn to um, Vasu, if you'd like to respond to any of these issues now, after which I want to turn to the panel and ask them whether any of them are, to quote you, Rohit, even briefly optimistic. <laughs> I think the brevity of optimism is obviously a very important issue here. Right. For how long can you hold your breath and be optimistic? Or maybe you take a deep breath and you're optimistic for longer. Right. So I want to deal with that after which we can open up to the audience. Okay. 
Um, I think what I'll do, uh, Homi, is uh, with your permission, because very sort of, you know, uh, broad points were made by uh, the panelists, which if I get into each of them, will will take a considerable amount of time. What I did during my presentation was to give you one arc of the two arcs which I described have worsened. One is, as I said, the idea of India as a secular liberal society. And the attempt was to try and characterize what exactly is it that has worsened and why it's hard to capture it. So now as I tried to point out in my presentation, we have some idea. What, what are the things that have worsened, right? We've seen there's a worsening of uh, the sort of uh, language, the discourse of high political figures. That is distinctly worsened. Uh, there's a clear worsening of the attacks on minorities using this prism of cow protection and so on. Um, when it comes to the worsening of democratic institutions, uh, you know, some of which Rohit listed. Again, this business of doing it through the method of a thousand cuts makes it that much more harder to capture and that much harder to resist, right? So I think this whole business of normalizing uh, these sorts of assaults, and, and that's something I, I suspect is happening in other parts of the world, including here in America, is something that deeply concerns me as a journalist and is something that I try to report on. I didn't spend too much time on that because there was a shortage of time and I didn't particularly talk about the media because what has been happening with the media again is very interesting and it's also happening using the same modus operandi of trying to bleed us through a thousand cuts. So we have a very large and diverse media. We have uh, 400 registered news channels. Okay, just digest that number for a minute. And about 100,000 licensed newspapers. And I'm not even counting now digital. What has been remarkable is how this diverse, crappy, fragmented, rambunctious media has been brought to heel largely without firing a single shot. It's not as if journalists are, being, are not being killed in India. They are. Uh, it's not as if we don't have retrograde laws that govern the media. We do have those laws. It's not as if we've not slipped in the media freedom index in the past year from 136 to 138, compiled by the reporters without borders. But that's not the real crisis. The real crisis is how newsroom after newsroom is witnessing a sort of internal coup. It's the enemy within, proprietors, owners, publishers, because of real or imagined threats, are choking any kind of uncomfortable journalism. And that actually is much harder to fight because it's like a tree falling in the night. You've not been able to understand exactly what's happened. And I'll, I'll give you a small example, Homi, with your permission, of what happened with one of India's leading newspapers. This is a very middle of the road, you know, playing it safe daily. Brings in an editor from the Wall Street Journal. Yeah, well, what's the name of the paper? <laughs> well, Homi, this is all, you know, being telecast live and and are we indemnified okay it's not a secret to at least those in the know so uh, but if you insist it's the hindustan times they bring in an editor the under his watch a hate tracker is launched which counts hate crimes and you know sort of similar to what we were doing this creates a bit of a stir within a few months the editor is sacked and on the last day that he comes to office, or just a day or two after that, the tracker vanishes from its website, okay? No explanation is given either for the sacking or the taking down of the hate tracker. It turns out, and this is, you know, this was sort of widely discussed in Delhi, that the newspaper holds an annual summit where they call the high and mighty, and that year they wanted to invite the prime minister as the chief guest. And the quid pro quo was that if you Want the Prime Minister, you have to sack the editor and take down the hate tracker. So sure enough, a few months later, they hold the summit and lo and behold, the Prime Minister is there as the chief guest. Right? But as I said, this is all a matter of conjecture. We don't know for a fact exactly how it played out. But I can list example after example to you as to how journalists and journalism of the provocative kind, of the kind that speaks truth to power, is being kneecapped on a regular basis editor after editor, anchor after ed anchor, is 
taken out of circulation and the organization falls in line that's the whole idea that you have to somehow bring everybody in line and i think pakistan again uh, and other parts of south asia are seeing this this has to do with structural issues of the ownership of the media how the media is funded of the kind of uh, financial pressures and constraints that legacy media faces for a number of reasons again too many to list here but it's important to acknowledge this and to remember this because all too often we think of threats to the media as external we think of uh, online harassment we think of censorship laws we think of government crackdowns we think of say what, for example what erdogan is doing in turkey or what's happening to journalists in russia but this is also part of the problem and i think it's time that we start acknowledging it it's time we start confronting some of these weak need proprietors and publishers and editors and start involving them in these sorts of discussions if we really want to see a shift in the kind of distortion that is happening to the media narrative in india you know thank you so much it's interesting that unconsciously you use the word saying journalism of a provocative kind you're not provocative it's only that you're perceived to be provocative you're doing exactly what absolutely. you're supposed to do absolutely but now it seemed to be a provocation no absolutely in fact uh, i said this uh, quoting somebody i'm not sure who someone more famous than i that just speaking the truth in india has become revolutionary you know so it's you're absolutely right this is just being targeted for doing optimism, one's job Sorry. optimism about yes. the end of hatred and this sort of tendency in india pakistan or well, optimism through this whole process what do you see how what is what makes you optimistic i think things in india will get much worse before they get better well that is uh, an optimism uh, by another kind of yes, definition uh, uh, as for yeah, pakistan as for pakistan i'm very uh, um, i mean i lack uh, optimism because i think there we've just witnessed um a regression Mm. um uh, and i think a consolidation of authoritarianism in a in a new guise uh, which we have to wait and see uh, how it will pan out but as i said the key issue here is delivery governance mm. and i have grave doubts but my bigger doubt and i think this is something that is across the board in south asia uh, and why i don't have optimism is mm. that i really believe that in um what i call the decolonization of the mind 70 years Uh, and i think that we are retrograde rather than um uh, you know progressive in the way that we have utilized um the need for the decolonization of many of our value systems the way in which we classify the way in which we perceive and see all of them are really from the colonial period when can we sit down together and discuss what is in our best interest but um, i should let me ask you this how much do you think that the that these categories and i completely agree with you they inherited categories and we want to make them you know in a utilitarian way work better we want the, them to function better but they fail how much of this is also due to global pressures of various kinds in which nations in south asia have been treated with this kind of seduce and abandon foreign policies of powerful nations how much is this do you think there has been a freedom to reconceptualize these there is degrees? there has never been any justice in the world nor is there going to be uh, we are going to just have to continue fighting uh, and that's what i mean about democracy and authoritarianism these are not sort of one as opposed to mm. the other they are really two ends of the same spectrum and it depends on the particular balance between dominance and resistance where you are um uh, so i think that's important but i suppose what i would like to say about india is that in this democratic process uh, there's a real danger of losing the capacity to resist um uh, in pakistan the problem is that because of years of authoritarianism uh, nobody really believes the government uh, in india i think there's too much of a buy in that needs to be corrected Uh, so I mean, I, I so th- my optimism is very, very cautious. Uh, I'm afraid. Quite right. And I, as I said in my <laughs> opening comment, what uh, Adorno's real issue yeah. was that what are the factors within democracy sure, that are justified and become make you complicit to the growth of a certain kind of authoritarianism or fascism? Sugar to. 
What makes you optimistic even for a fleeting moment? Uh, before I answer your are you uh, optimistic yeah. uh, uh, question, uh, uh, may I just raise a question to bring uh, Vasu and Rohit into uh, dialogue? Uh, I think it was very important that Vasu did that uh, Harpoor sting operation because the main perpetrator uh, 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 ha had got out of jail uh, claiming that he wasn't there on the scene. Yes. What's more, that incident was initially being uh, you know, described as uh, a lynching all right, but an incident of road rage yes. rather than linked to cow vigilantism. Yes. No, you know, all that sort of, those lies were uh, exposed in, in, your, uh, in, in your sting. And then uh, the, the Supreme Court uh, recently uh, said that uh, there ought to be a new central law, a federal law uh, on lynching. And of course, the government did exactly what uh, our colonial masters had taught us to do. Uh, they have formed a committee to look into uh, the framing of a, uh, of, of a new law. And I would like to ask Rohit whether, uh, uh, whether a law would help. If you look at United States history, um, you know, all the attempts to have an anti-lynching law since about 1918 were defeated in the se Senate uh, by, you know, a group of conservative uh, Southern Democrats. And only this year, on the 30th of June, uh, Kamala Harris and Cory Booker and one other senator uh, introduced uh, a bill, um, you know, which will be really symbolic. Uh, and uh, as is evident that there were lynchings of many kinds in America, but more than 75% of the victims uh, were African Americans, you know, just as close to 90% of the victims in India are, uh, are, are Muslims. Uh, so, you know, would a lynching law help or should something be done urgently? Or will we in India be in a position several decades later to do what the US Senate did, did in 2005, apologize for lynchings that had taken place in the past? So what can you know, the legal system, um, the, the judiciary sort of do, uh, or what can parliament do uh, to address uh, what is an urgent problem today? In terms of optimism, um, you know, uh, I can be analytic, mm. but I can also you know, speak as someone who, you know, tried to provide a principled voice in opposition ever since, uh, you know, 2014 and even before, you know, Modi, you know, got uh, elected as prime minister. I think uh, optimism is in some ways a pragmatic necessity uh, for us. Uh, you know, pessimism in, will be so terribly self-defeating. And so even on the day that I first sort of spoke in parliament, I was trying to you know, somehow lift the pall of gloom that had descended uh, on us and saying things like how unrepresentative this 16th Lok Sabha is. If you, you know, look at, you looked at UP, uh, there were 80 MPs in a state with a 20% Muslim population and there was not one Muslim MP elected from that state. Only very recently in a by-election a Muslim woman has been, uh, uh, has been elected. And then also, I think it's very important to take on the votaries of religious majoritarianism. Uh, you know, Narendra Modi began to claim from August 2017 that the next five years, 2017 to 2022, will be as transformative as the years 1942 to 1947. This is what he claimed uh, in a speech that he made on the, in Parliament on the occasion of uh, the uh, 75th anniversary of the Quit India movement. And uh, he wanted to dominate. He wanted to say it will, the, there will be transformation because the top constitutional posts, all three of them, are now held by those who subscribe to the same ideology, i.e. the ideology of Hindutva. So the inference was clear. We are going to see a Hindu Rashtra on the 75th anniversary of independence. And in that kind of a scenario, it was very important to counterpose a different vision of India from the vision of a new India that was being projected by Modi, that in place of the untrammeled dominance of one religious community and one language, there can, in fact, be an alternative vision uh, of, uh, of an India uh, which is based on the cultural intimacy of uh, 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 India's uh, very many diverse communities. So in that sense, I think that if the fight back is to take place, as uh, Aisha wants, then we have no option but to be optimistic, even if 
we find numerous failings among you know opposition parties and politicians who have as yet been unable to articulate a credible national alternative uh, that you know that people can trust th 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 thank you sugar i just want to say something you know of course the spate of the killing of young black men is not a lynching mm -hmm. but it is there but there is a kind of family resemblance of between them that the killing of young black men by the police for various reasons uh, as tanahisi coates put it beautifully one person was killed because he had a hoodie on another person another black person kid was killed because he was listening to the wrong music a third one was scared when the police car came and he ran you know these are not lynchings in the old okay. st tradition yeah, but they are lynchings in our tradition there are lynchings in our lives now and so i think you know the symbolic kamala harris and cory booker um, um, uh, proposition Prop proposition yeah. Yeah. is indeed speaks very closely to the world we are in right i want you to range across and then we will open up but i do want to ask you whether the progressive nature of our constitution people describe it because of ambedkar's presence you know that it is a it is a minoritarian constitution it's a progressive do you think that there is some optimism to be found there by returning to the constitution rather like justice scalia this is a joke by the way <laughs> anyway uh so maybe i'll answer your last question first and then get to optimism and uh the law uh no and i don't i would not recommend originalism for any society yeah, certainly right. not the united states uh i don't think i mean the constitution is a uh, act of political compromise accommodating numerous interests uh, what makes it progressive is not its authors though they were all men and women who managed to work together to forge this consensus but really what makes it progressive is the fact that progressive groups and progressive individuals have been able to harness it uh, and push it towards a certain direction uh, and i would not suggest that the constitution be set in stone and nothing be ever changed uh, well, but you know, it has to move to yeah i know i know I, but I, i felt like i needed to uh, uh yes, <laughs> clarify right. it some jokes fall flat <laughs> right. there was a great deal of inheritance yeah. uh, in terms of the uh, clauses of the 1935 yeah. Yeah. government of india act in the constitution yeah. so the, it's yeah. not the document that, that is, is necessarily the practice around but, but but many people including several judges are advocating originalism yeah. in india and i thought it it's good to sort of put that on the ground thank you uh the second is about optimism and you know ironically it's because i've read professor jalal's work that i am more optimistic uh, i think what your work shows is that it's at some level structurally not possible to govern societies in south asia through maximalist authoritarian measures at some point they crack apart and the real question is who has to suffer to wait till that point where it cracks and it gives up so um the second thing in the indian context that gives me ground for optimism is the one remarkable feature of indian democracy has been expansion of franchise mm. uh, unlike the us where there is vast uh, exclusion of people from franchise often from marginalized and poor sections in india at least till now these have been groups that have got franchise and have participated in it heavily uh and that has been at some level the the kind of thing that upsets the apple cart uh, and i remember 2004 and the election results were unexpected uh, and people talk about the 1977 results and i'm hoping that to that extent those kinds of electoral connections can happen um lastly uh, i i think uh, I mean one I'm very appreciative of the sting operation that Chenevasan did I wanted to just the I when I was referring to videos I was talking about the videos of the actual crime itself that is circulating yeah. um I think uh, anti lynching law would have symbolic benefits but it's not going to stop anything uh partly because the regular old fashioned colonial indian penal code has enough and more provisions to deal with lynching the fact that they don't deal with it is either lack of political uh, independence and will or the fact that we have a widely unrepresentative police force which does not reflect the demographics of society that it governs so unless those two things are changed i, I which is also a... true of the colonial army which yes. was also very unrepresentative which is interesting to see how these things repeat well um it's it's important for a humanity center event to show how interpretations can be creative and that uh, my friend Aisha Jalal's
pessimism, with which I have a great sympathy, was now turned into optimism by you, <laughs> Rohit. I think this is lovely. I think this is exactly the way in which discussions should go and negotiations should happen. I just want to end before I open it up to the to the uh, to the to the to the audience with the idea, and I don't know why Adorno keeps coming to my mind today. Adorno said, "The only way to live with political situations and resistance is." to live in a state of disappointed hope. <laughs> and I think that's exactly where we are now, a state of disappointed, the best you can get. I completely agree. I, absolutely. And I want a hand of applause for these wonderful presentations. Thank you. Right. Questions from the, questions from the audience. And please introduce yourselves. The man in red. Please introduce yourself. Um, hi. Um, so I am a recent graduate from Carnegie Mellon. I'm, I'm, I just came to Boston for work. Um, so uh, I might be sort of a black sheep in the room. Um, you I, are a black sheep in the room. Yes, I, I, I think so. Um, okay. So uh, this particular session, I think, is like is exactly like a manifestation of a social media eco chamber, wherein um, I mean, I would most closely agree with uh, Mrs. Aisha wherein she says there's a lot of narrative building. Um, and uh, although I'm not definitely the individual instances of lynchings and all of that definitely real issues, I think there can be a counter um, to a lot of the broad issues mentioned here. And I think it's important to uh, have people from the other side too because there are legitimate voices on the other side and that's why, I mean, it's not like, uh, one side is the only uh, self-righteous side. So I think um, such discussion sessions should have or include people from the other side so that we actually come to some um, conclusions and we kind of proceed towards a progressive society. So you're from the other side, so please give us some part I'm of I'm not... Uh, no, give us some, no, give us some sense of what a counter-narrative would be. Well, I just on the. I mean, I, your criticism is taken. Yeah. I wanted to explore this notion of democracy in distress. But let us hear from you yeah. what the counter narrative would be. But also, let me respond. To no, well, let me yeah. first hear yeah, the yeah, counter narrative. Sure, sure. Let's hear the counter narrative, which no, I think I, is a I legitimate just, uh, issue. F firstly, I think a lot of uh, yeah. the um, why we've seen a lot of a lot of these instances uh, in the past. Five years is, I think, a lot of lot of it is, is to do with the uh, uh, rise of social media by itself. We didn't have uh, this sort of a uh, environment on the internet, uh, like say seven, eight years back. A lot of it is because of that, and it's amplified because of that. So, um, and uh, well, I'm not a scholar in this issue, but I'm just saying, like, from an outsider, from a layman's perspective, from whatever I read on the internet, there are obviously two sides to the coin, and in this room, I heard only one side. Which is which is fine, but it's not exactly. Um, uh, it doesn't lead to like specific solutions or conclusions. No, you're you're right. It doesn't lead to specific conclusions, and I think you're also. At one oh, sure, second, sure, sure. Sure. Let us first be properly lynched, and then we will rise. Okay. And respond. And but I also think you're right that we did not include somebody here from the RSS or the BJP. You're you're absolutely right. We didn't do it. But the question of the other narrative, I mean, there's a large audience here. Nobody has directed people not to appear in the audience and ask any questions as you've done, yeah. you've done very usefully. The social media issue, and I'm going to hand over to you, is not the only issue here. The issue is when the government itself does not in any way punish or castigate its office senior office holders when they spew the kind of I agree with that point, Jacob. That is the yeah. important issue here. Oh, definitely. And that's one of the things we wanted to bring to the table yes. because if you go to India, as you said and you've said too, largely in the media, yeah. there is no voice. There, It is not possible to talk. Yeah, no, some of the points are definitely thank valid. You. But anyway, like, thank you. So I, no, I just want to quickly respond to this idea of sides, that there's only people from one side here. So just to make it clear that I don't think I represent any side, right? The only side that ideally journalists should be are on the side of facts. 
But unfortunately, what has happened is that facts themselves have become contested and are being seen now through the prism of left or right, while there is something as a clearly established, you know, at establishable truth. So I don't think that reporting any of this puts you in one or the other side, yeah. right? We've reported on the egregious crimes, quote unquote, of previous governments as well. But if there is something which is characteristically worsened under a present regime, it's our duty to bring it out. Yeah. So the idea of actually doing it in this form was so that it insulates it from this kind of criticism that, oh, you've shown one side, there's another side. Yeah. What other side is there? If hate speech has gone up 500, you know, 500%, it's gone up 500%. You can't dispute that. Yeah. So I think let's not reduce everything to these, you know, easy social media binaries. Right. Let's try to look at things, you know, truths or facts as they are on their own standing. So, yeah, I mean, I'd, yeah. I'd really urge that. Thank you. Let's ha hear about uh, two or three questions and then bring it to the panel. Sure. Right, so there's somebody here. Um, there's, my, yes, Diana, there at the back. One, two, three, four. Let, let's do this little sector and then we'll move to that end of the room. Hopefully. Um, hi. Um, my name is Vaishnavi. I'm a student at the grad Harvard Graduate School of Design, and um, I just started. So I'm taking a lot of courses in uh, politics in the Department of Public Administration, Politics, and Religion, and just recently completed a paper which is talking about the American economy and the effect of politics on religion. And that made me think about all those theories within the Indian context, and you know, I was sort of reflecting on that. Um, and I sort of agree with Aisha here a lot, because uh, knowing that we come from a secular constitution um, where we don't have a state religion, and on the other side, as a country that is extremely democratic, how do you really understand the scenario or the phenomenon where uh, a state itself elects a religious head to sort of govern the whole thing? I mean, Yogi Adityanath, as a monk who is now a uh, religious leader uh, in politics sort of affecting the whole thing. And then talking about optimism, and that's the second point, I was just thinking about it, what happened to the Catholic Church was uh, people started having their own interpretations and sort of derived new religions out of that. So you had the Catholic Christianity, then you have the Protestants, you have the Reformist. And it kept on reviving it itself through like newer interpretations or like creation of new religions. Whereas I see what's happening inside, and I'm politically undeclared, I'm not even religious, but just what there's two ways I think where things can change. One is it's either uh, a new religion, which is like you're talking about revival in religion, or the second is uh, a revolt. And that's where I think where Pakistan comes from is a state of revolt. But I, I mean, I don't know where we are headed. Thank you. I All right. Just Thank you very much for your, that was a comment rather than question, but let's move here to these to here and then to uh, the lady in the white in the back, Diana, yeah. Uh, good evening, my name is Sudarshana and I'm a graduate student in the Department of History. Um, so my question comes from a space of disappointed hope um, and draws upon some of the ideas that you put forward about resistance, about media, about there being uh, narratives in different sides. Um, because we've been talking about social media as well there has been recently a lot of WhatsApp groups and fake news circulating, uh, you know, uh, on the WhatsApp medium, which have been successful in converting a lot of people who are uh, more or less skeptical still. What do we do about that kind of fake news? Okay, what do we do about fake news in social media? Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, question, yeah. Please, everybody keep take note of these questions. Thank you, Diana Eck. And I just, um, I teach a little bit about some of these things here, but this has been a really informative panel. Thank and you. I think the issue of being afraid to speak the truth or speaking the truth being revolutionary is something I've heard from uh, friends in India. There's not, it, it's not a sort of society these days in which people feel comfortable just speaking out. Absolutely. Um, and, uh, you know, that's a very disturbing thing. Um, and I know that there are voices on the other side. I know there are not, you know, people who think this cow killing thing is absurd and let's just call it that. And the ways in which people have been lynched and the, and, and, and even including um, figures like Swami Agnivesh who was beaten up rather badly 
um, but I think there are people who are uh, sort of speaking out and not not having a good time of it there. Yeah. So Absolutely. I mean, it's that sense of uh, of sort of the cowing of the uh, you know of the populace of people who, whether in universities or you know in public uh, yeah. fora, just don't just are afraid to speak. Thank you. And of course, we must therefore we must raise this issue that people are harassed. There's a huge harassment of people. It's you know they're harassed legally. They're harassed, you know, in terms of their own security. So I think that, you know, we really need to uh, air these issues where we are relatively safe. Uh, yes, a question here, please. And then we can turn to the panel. Hi, um, uh, I'm a research fellow at MIT. Um, I have a very simple question. So in 2014, the BJP won over 70% of the seats in the parliament with uh, a little over 30% 30, 30 of the popular vote. And there was some talk of how the Indian parliament is no, no longer representative of the electorate. Is first past the post unsuitable for our country, or is untenable <laughs> in 2014? Excellent. Yeah. Let's turn now to uh, Aisha why don't, No, Yeah, we will come to No, no, hang on, hang on, hang on. Let's, this is democracy in operation, not democracy in distress. And so in you distress. choose so as, the, you, yes. as you please. That's uh, right. I'd like to respond to the fake news question, uh, what to do with fake news. I think is to ignore it. Uh, I think far too much importance is placed in, in circulating fake news. I think the whole ethos of social media needs to be thought by young people and not so young people. I think this tendency to just forward things and just shoot <laughs> things off has to stop. I mean, you need to control yourself. This is a civil society out of control. <laughs> yeah, That's what I think. No, um, um, and then uh, I think I don't know anything else to respond to. Actually. But you know, just to support me, in this very room, in this very room, we once had a very fine uh, presidential historian who had written a blog which had gone viral. And um, um, uh, my colleague, Steve, said to me, you know, maybe we should have her. So we had her on a very distinguished panel. And well, the story she told was so much what you said. She said, I was writing a rather dull academic article. And then some thought came to me, and I wrote a blog. I posted it, and I went out to dinner. And I came back to find that 2,000 people or 300 people or 600 people had responded to it. She said, in retrospect, I don't think it was very good. <laughs> but once the, vi once the virality carries on, then opinion gets to be formed. We've got to be very careful about public opinion. Well, you form public opinion, but yeah. don't send things that are dubious. Yeah. I do think a but, lot but, of people do yeah. that. But people will do that. If Homie, sorry, can I just, yes. on, the, on the fake news point, while I agree that self-regulation is important, but at the same time, it's not as if you can just let Claims also go uncontested. Of course. For instance, what you just saw was an example of busting of fake news, as in the case of the Meerut Love Jihad case, right? So, something like that, a completely manufactured fiction about gang rape and Maulanas and so on, has the potential to create social unrest, which it did. And the busting of it does help, in some cases, to cool things down. So, I don't think it's about ignoring. Uh, fake news. It's about what fake news is it that you choose to bust. If you want to sit and go after every single WhatsApp forward, there's no end to it. But certainly the most egregious examples, especially when the state lies or the state is putting out false uh, claims or propaganda or of this kind of incendiary stuff, I think there it's important to actually come out and do it. And to your point as to what should be done, as you probably know in the Indian context and the world over, Increasingly, news organizations are <laughs> investing huge amounts of resources to busting fake news. So that's already organically happening. There are mainstream media doing it. There are all sorts of websites and portals doing it. And uh, you know, I think that's a good thing. Except, of course, that fake news seems to be more attractive than <laughs> prosaic, <laughs> factual <laughs> news. People love fake news. I mean, it's not for nothing. It's more that entertaining. It's, more in it's not for nothing. <laughs> that Satan is the real hero of Milton's Paradise Lost. And by the time God comes there, nobody's interested in reading any further. Uh, I'd like to respond to the religion question, if I yeah. uh, may, briefly. And here I'm really borrowing from uh, Ayesha to say that we really 
need to be make sure that we don't make religion our enemy and what we need to target is uh, religious bigotry. bigotry religious prejudice uh, and you know most people uh, in our subcontinent whether it's india pakistan or bangladesh are have religious faith they are god fearing in some way but i also think that uh, an overwhelming majority among them uh, are, uh, are are not uh, harboring prejudice mm. against members of an uh, you know uh, you know another uh, community so that i think is extremely important and that's why it's import that's why i've argued for a rethinking of uh, of secularism uh, that uh, you know those of us who were bred in the nehruvian secular tradition uh, you know ha ha had to um, reflect a bit particularly after you know the ram janam bhumi movement the babri masjid demolition and even more so uh, of uh, of late uh, so i think if we if we are able to disaggregate this category of of religion uh, then we will, we would understand that a lot of what is going on is really about politics with you know religious bigotry you know uh, thrown in uh, thrown into this uh, uh, thrown into this mix and also i I just wanted also to say that you know here is a panel where we have a journalist who is trying to report truth and is trying to bring down the hype and there are three historians who were asked to comment on what he had to say and also provide you know broader uh, broader context uh, that is you know what we have been doing but we all are uh, have multiple identities uh, so a few days ago I spoke uh, in a faculty seminar organized by my colleague Jamal Kafadar under the rubric the historian as public intellectual and my role in india uh, since 2014 has really been that of a historian as a public intellectual uh, who had chosen uh, the indian parliament as a venue uh, to express uh, my my views and there i have to say uh, one had to face a solid phalanx of 330 members of the ruling party that included yogi adityanath until he became chief minister of uh, uh, uttar pradesh and uh, you know uh, uh, but even under those circumstances uh, it's important uh, to to be able to you know articulate sort of one's uh, one's views so i'm not uh, 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 you know uh, uh, i i don't feel too badly about the composition of this particular uh, panel uh, <laughs> and what i had to do of course and you know i've got some uh, 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 you know respect from even those whom i excoriate day in and day out and uh, in a particular debate that i was i was mentioning on the occasion of the 75th anniversary of the quit india movement i had to call upon them they were all there led by narendra modi and i basically said that i know that you have your own gurujis whom you revere but since we are commemorating a, a movement led by mahatma gandhi may i invite you to you know to come over to our our side for the next 5 years and follow the path lit up by the halo of mahatma gandhi whose 150th birth anniversary has just started by the way so i think numbers don't matter that much and i think you just simply need a civil atmosphere within which you can express your views and without fear and that's why what dana uh, professor dana ek is saying is so important that there is an atmosphere of intimidation and you know that has to change did you also ask the opposition to join that very eminent uh, a prophet in calcutta karl marx <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Um so I did, uh, I'm sorry the gentleman read I didn't catch your name want to respond to you and then in relation to that to professor Ek uh and it's really going back to this question of uh sides um so one is I would partly blame television channels for this narrative because there is this argument that you have to create a diverse panel so you produce people who represent all possible points of view even though in some cases the points of view or even the person's ability to represent that point of view is highly dubious um and it is interesting that this would not happen in the case of discussions on science for example uh if you had someone discussing um effects of climate change uh would 
would the television channel bring in a climate change denier or if you have a conversation around you know uh, the the kind of mars mission would you have someone who says actually mars is inhabited by little green men who you know might so so i think there's something about social science that argues that social science is not scientific you don't speak from expertise you speak from opinion and i would sort of argue, i would sort of request and gesture that we need to treat some of this more seriously. So for example, uh, there are two ways one can say the government after uh, 2014 is not representative. Uh, one is that it doesn't represent my point of view, and that's not the argument I was making. The other is that statistically, if we look at how the ethnic composition of previous parliaments have been, compared to that, this parliament, while it gets 31% of the vote, does not represent all those groups in similar proportions. Uh, and this goes back to uh, the comment that Professor Eck raised about the inability of people to speak up. I I'm always surprised by how much, and I think the Pakistan example is always uh, optimistic to read, that even in worse situations, many people are brave, they speak up, they act in areas without the glare of the media, and they face attacks. Uh, in India, for example, recently a whole slate of civil liberties lawyers have been arrested. And again, it's seen as a question of size. These are lawyers from the left, and they were arrested. But we forget, uh, and I think it's embarrassing that it's changed, that some of the greatest civil liberties lawyers in their time, today serve in the government. Uh, in the 1970s, Arun Jaitley was involved in the People's Union for Civil Liberties. Uh, Sushma Swaraj represented people who were detained during the emergency. Ravi Shankar Prasad was going on fact-finding missions with the PUSCR in the 80s. And civil liberties in India was started by um, uh, the president of the Hindu Mahasabha in the 1950s. Uh, and the, one of the first clients he represented in the Supreme Court was someone who was a, a communist who was accused of uh, spreading sedition and acting against the state. So there was a time in India where the right and the left could come together on civil liberties, but the right seems to have abandoned the civil liberties and the constitution as resources and left it to the other side to take over. And I think in some way, one the the the, the endeavor to move towards should be to re-embrace that at least common conception of civility and legal forms. Now that is an excellent point to end, except that I have given the nod. So I want just one, just a little longer and we'll, we'll, we'll be able to have a drink. <laughs> so let me just yeah, but but I'm only going to choose one, two, and and that gentleman in the white shirt. But I want questions. I do not want comments. Question, a little sentence with a question mark at the end. No long comments. Okay, start. Thank you. My name is Shamir, and I'm doing masters in global health delivery program at medical school, and I'm from Kerala, and. Uh, we have issues in India, we have issues in subcontinent and Myanmar, Bangladesh, everywhere. Can Kerala be a role model for enter India in terms of dealing these issues? Yes or no? <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, we'll go through that. Yes, and one the second and then the third with the gentleman with the specs and the white. Yeah. Hi, my name is Asad Palijo and I'm from Pakistan. I'm a mid-career student at Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, I must commend you uh, for your terrific uh, reporting because in Pakistan we don't find an equivalent uh, on the airwaves in any of the uh, media outlets. Uh, Ahmadis have been massacred, Hazaras have been massacred, and we don't. And everybody knows who they are, but nobody has the has has the courage to go. So my question is about the human side of it. Uh, what kind of um, personal sacrifices do you have to make to speak truth to power? Thank you. Mm, thank you. And the final question better be a really good one. <laughs> a lot of pressure on you. Uh, uh, professor, my name is Shah Vassal. I'm from Kashmir, and I'm a, I'm a graduate student at the Kennedy School. So I was my, my question is in response to, to your comment on disappointed hope. So if you look at India and you look at the last 50 years, we have seen a series of militant insurgencies or resistance movements which worked around the denial of political or socio-economic rights. So we saw an insurgency in Kashmir, we saw in Punjab, we saw something of that sort in Tamil Nadu. We have a very thriving Naxalite insurgency. So my specific question is that what does it mean for India to have around 200 million people disenfranchised in the next 20 years? Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you all very much. Let's just have a quick whip round here. Uh, the first question is, can Kerala be the model for the rest of India? This is a sort of a regional foundationalist and fundamentalist perspective, uh, <laughs> which we should all applaud for its courage. Uh, but let's get to it. Yes or no? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, Maybe. What price? Um, <laughs> yes. A uh, hefty price uh, in the sense that I think more than myself, because I'm not a human rights activist, I'm, a, I'm an academic, and I write mainly in English, which nobody reads in Pakistan, or very few do. 
And so the military establishment, with all due respect to them, I suppose they don't really care what I say. I'm nobody. But the people who have sacrificed are amongst, I mean, some, one that I would like to mention is Asma Jahangir, whom we lost earlier this year, who has expended together with a wonderful team all their energies in fighting for the minorities, the vulnerable minorities. And the price is very high. Your life is completely wrapped up here. You can't really lead a normal life once you become an advocate for the suppressed minorities. So it's a whole life, as, as she puts it, um, Asma, that it's not, human rights is not um, a, a profession, it's a conviction. And you pay a heavy price for it. I just want to also respond to that question which the friend from Pakistan raised about the price. So just to give you an idea of our own organization. So in the past four and a half years, we now have cases against us from every investigating agency in India. Right? We have a, there's the CBI, which is the federal investigating agency, income tax cases, cases by the enforcement directorate, which investigates financial fraud. These are completely manufactured cases and we're fighting them in court. But what it does is that it dents your operational ability, mm. right? So when you, when investors, when advertisers see that you're facing corruption cases, you're facing this kind of heat from the government, they start to pull back. In addition to that, the government has actually taken to calling up some of our sponsors and advertisers and actually threatening them, you know, in, in not so subtle ways that if you go ahead and you want to fund this channel, then there will be consequences. Right? So this leads you into a downward spiral of operational ability. As your funds come down, you have to start laying people off. Your news resources about able to go and do the kind of journalism that you've seen comes down. Your ratings fall, your revenue falls, and then you're in that downward cycle. So actually, you do pay a price for this kind of journalism. But that's then up to each organization to think whether they want to continue with it or they want to fall in line. But this is not just the case of NDTV alone. If you speak to the few islands of journalism and journalists who are doing this kind of work, they will all have similar stories to tell in one degree or the other. Let's take up the question of Kashmir, if you don't mind, because I think that is an important question. We have to uh, uh, call to this, to this uh, very interesting discussion to a close. Let's go with you. How would you respond to that Kashmir question? So I think uh, Shah Faisal would actually be a better person to give the answer, given that he's exactly. been in the unenviable position of uh, facing um, the Kash facing voices in Kashmir on one side and facing voices within the rest of the Indian Republic on the other side, and knows how to negotiate this better. Uh, I'd just like to, there's a brief moment in uh, Basharat Peer's book where he says the first time he realizes there is a different India is when he's on a train going from Srinagar to Aligarh and uh, a couple of army men get on and sit on the seat and um, the other Indians are like, do you have a ticket? And the soldiers were like, no, but we're soldiers, we're going home. And they're like, if you don't have a ticket, get out of here. And he says, I realize there is an India outside Kashmir where this happens. Mm. And I think I am increasingly concerned that I think that India outside Kashmir is beginning to look a lot more like what happens inside Kashmir. Uh, and I think in some ways we are paying for not responding to these territories that exist within the Indian Republic as exceptions early on. And we can't solve what happens in the rest of India without addressing sort of deep uh, illegalities that happen in many parts of, of Indian territory. And this is also an interesting echo with you because Kashmir is one part of the country where the military really rule the roost. There is, so I think that's an interesting issue of having a bit of the Pakistan problem right in the center, right at the, at, at the borders of India. Shugato. The last word for you. Well, on the Kerala question, there is no uh, yes or no answer. It's yes when it comes to access to health and education. No, uh, when it comes to political violence uh, uh, of the sort that is taking place in Kannur. Yes. Uh, there is a journalist, uh, uh, Ullek NP, who has written a very good book on that, uh, uh, on that topic. I would like to address the question on Kashmir, but also you know, the 200 million sort of uh, disenfranchised. And they are of two kinds. In the tribal heartland, of course, uh, you have those who are mired in poverty, they're excluded, and there is a government in uh, alliance with big business who, and who, who want to, you know, uh, allow them to uh, take away the minerals and forest resources and so forth. So you see one kind of insurgency sort of there. 
uh, and the hunger index, by the way, is very high, in, particularly in those parts of India. And then th there are the other regions, Kashmir, of course, but also much of the Northeast, where historically, you know, over uh, the decades since independence, there has been a denial of democracy and, and a negation of federal autonomy. And I agree with Rohit that I think there are many citizens of India in other parts of, in, uh, you know, in, uh, outside of these uh, regions who are now, you know, paying the price uh, for having been silent for, for so long uh, uh, when, you know, these atrocities have taken place in certain, quote unquote, peripheral regions uh, of, uh, of India. So I think that uh, we really must in the future think of one standard of democracy uh, for, uh, the, for the whole country, particularly those which are claimed as integral parts of the uh, Indian Union. And also we need to recognize that Indian unity has only worked when it has, when it has been of a genuine federal type. Uh, you, we, we must learn how to give a sense of belonging uh, to people living in regions where they have been denied rights for, uh, for, for very long. And uh, that will mean, you know, rethinking uh, our, our concept of, uh, of sovereignty, uh, you know, altering some of the structures uh, of, our, of our state. So, uh, so if we don't address these issues, then I think uh, we, play, uh, we face a very bleak future. But if they can be addressed, and if the current phase of religious majoritarianism results in a new kind of politics, uh, a new kind of democratic politics, and a new federalism in India, then perhaps we can be optimistic, <laughs> as uh, our think, I think our uh, chairman would With a touch like of disappointment, to, uh, <laughs> to well, keep us sharp. Perhaps the disappointments <laughs> will recede and uh, you know, hope will rise. Well, thank you so much. I want to thank Vasu, Vasu for being here and giving us this occasion for having this discussion. Thank you. And, the, and all my panelists for a wonderful participation. Uh, I think we were not of one mind, but I think we did what universities could best do, which is have moments of convergence. We come from different places. We may go to other places or other ideas. But these convergent moments, these constellations, are, I think, extremely important. And we will try as best we can to keep this discussion going, because the country, our countries here, are, are, are precious to us. They're inspirational to us. And yet, they are in extremis. And I think we need to speak from wherever we happen to be. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you, dear Aisha. We'll do